Oh, oh, we're live. Hola, Catch Fighting Connoisseurs. This is KidNativeBloodyElbow.com, joined once again by Dallas Winston and Eugene S. Robinson for one of our regrettable, unfortunate, and we apologize in advance. It's an MMA three-way. Watch out, everybody. There's no Cage Regrettable fighting. for you, baby, not for me. <laughs> uh-huh, uh-huh. There's a, no Cage Fighting this weekend, so we're going back down memory lane. We, today, are going to talk about the fighters. Memory lane. Memory the first lane. made us love the game, memory lane. The uh, reason we love life, but maybe not fighting. All right, who wants to go first? Who's picking their fighter? Eugene's already revealed offstage his embarrassing secret as to who his shameful and embarrassing first MMA inspiration was. Dallas has been KG. KG? KG. As in not letting us know. You said no one would want to dibs your guy, but that was it. Yeah, that's a pretty safe bet, I think. It's probably better that I start knowing who both of you guys are choosing. Yeah, go ahead. Because you guys really went, you know. I went predictable. And I, yeah, I, I'm sad. I, I was embarrassed about my pick, but I had to be honest. I had to. I, w I was like shocked, I but but uh, if you think that's well, my, my, my 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 reasons are convoluted and and, and complicated. So we, I would we, expect we, nothing less. So Dallas, you tell us. You're the mystery man. Well, I'd say both of you. Guys, I mean, predictable maybe, but I I mean extremely extremely viable. Mine will definitely not be a popular one because it's a personal one and it's. Um, Jerry Bolander from UFC 8. Oh. Jerry Bolander. Jerry Wait, was it because you have been picked on by giant overweight pit bulls yourself? Hey man, yeah. you know, you know, actually, I'm, I'm at Team Sorrell right now, and uh, he Bolander is one of Sorrell's heroes. Actually, strange, strange you should mention him. You know, he's one wow. of mine as well. So for me, I don't know how are you gonna. You know, run this uh, disaster, Nate. Are we all just going to get? We're like, just a couple pre-forming it. I, I figured we'd each have a, say our piece about our guy, kind of a little mini essay, and then we can heckle and and counterpoint. You can heckle and jekyll. Well, the, the only reason I ask is because Jerry Bolander's my pick for sure, but UFC eight just had a huge, huge impact on me. I so thought the it was the first like, one you saw, or had you already seen a couple? No, I actually started with UFC 1. I saw the pay-per-view, and then... I was just I because I knew you'd made that claim before. Okay, thanks. Glad. Good looking out. <laughs> Glad you have my back. That's what bosses are for. Uh-huh. Um, I had kind of... The, UFC 8 is what really made me like a hardcore fan, like passionate. That was the first time that... Um, it, in Because it was much more relatable... Bolander is kind of the centerpiece of all this because he was just some dude. You know, I mean, he was... <laughs> the other thing... Bless you. Jesus, you all right? Yeah, thank um, you, sir. I did one of my earliest interviews. It's probably to this date my favorite interview. I did one with uh, Jerry and then also another one with uh, Mario Bustamante, which were just really oh. cool for me. You know, And this is when I was writing for thegarv.com. So the Garv? Was, yep, thegarv.com. That's where I got, got my start. <clears throat> and it was, you know, me kind of the first time saying, wow, I can actually approach fighters that I really respected, admire, and have watched for all these years and say I'm with the MMA media and try not to laugh and get an interview with them. So just a quick background on UFC 8. That was the David versus Goliath tournament. Yeah. Kind of like the, the uh, part B to all this is Don Fry. Because in I'm not like a rah-rah American guy whatsoever, but in the, you know, starting with Hoist Gracie, and then even like Marco Huas, and this was the oh, first yeah, time. Yeah. Yep, and and this was the first time that it was like, wait a minute, this is just some dude that was you know like a wrestler, white boy from you know he trained at the Lions Den, uh, but he he took Not the mistake. I didn't train at the Lions Den. Are you no, talking I'm, about Jerry Boland? You switched back to Jerry, Jerry Boland. Yeah, All right. Well, why not Kim Shamrock or Dan Severn? They were just American guys. Well, they were, but to me, they all kind of had reps, you know. I mean, I knew about Ken over in Pancration, in uh, or in Pancrase, and he was billed as a Pancration fighter. And even though Jerry Bolander and all the Lions Dens guys fought under Ken, they were all billed as as shoot fighters. So to me, you know, when you see Hoist coming in, you know, that first that was to me kind of like Machida esque. There was a mystique about it, you know. Hoist and the whole Gracie family were learning submissions out of the womb. They were from Brazil. This was the first time where I was like, wait a minute, some you know strong athletic white boy can not only box but wrestle but also pick up some really good submission savvy. And what did it for me was he fought Scott Ferrazzo. 
Scott Ferrazzo, I mean, if you were to draw a, a vague caricature of this dude, you would start with a round shape. I mean, he was 330 right. pounds. Yeah, he looked, he literally, literally, he looked like Fred Flintstone. Right. I mean, just monstrous with these little stick legs. And it turns Fred out... Fred Flintstone he, had a giant cape that said, fear me, on it. It, yeah. it, how classic! How classic was there? Was some real class. I w actually went back and and skimmed back through that event this morning. There was that. The second guy, Don Fry, fought. Uh, Sam Adkins came out in like these full blown tight pants, but they were like tie dyed. I mean, you know, there was some serious nostalgia going on. So Bolander fought Ferrazzo, who turns out this guy would be a nightmare in the street. He was an All American, I think, Division Two nose guard. So yep. huge. I mean, the guy was like four feet wide, but he could move re really, yep. really well. He could punch. He was he was a mean son of a bitch. Yep. So that was the appeal of the whole event, David versus Goliath. And right off the bat, Ferrazzo came out, ducked his head down, got a hold of him, and just like wung him over his head. You know, rear waist cinch, belly to back suplex. The yep. first was a little one. The second one, he heaved him yep. and, and yep. threw him. So it was just like you'd imagine, like a 330 guy who's strong and athletic fighting. And when I interviewed Jerry, they billed him as 200. He said he was only 180 pounds at the time. Yep. And Jerry, of course, went on to become the first UFC lightweight champion, but that was the under 200 pounds that later Tito and Frank went on to take. So this was just, to me, like the one fight that did it. You know, if if I wouldn't have gone back and watched it, I remembered this being a grueling, like, half-hour battle. It was only nine minutes long. But... um. Before Jerry, Jerry guillotined him. With, yeah, and there was a long... First, this was... Headbutts were legal. Um, yeah. Ferrazzo was wearing a wrestling singlet, and every time he'd power Jerry into the fence, which he could do at will, Jerry would reach behind him and slip his hand under the first uh, you know, strap of his singlet and grab the other one and pull it all the way over. So it kind of almost worked as a minor nagging carotid artery choke that whole nice. time. Uh -huh. The thing that really stood out to me is Jerry is calm as hell. I mean... You guys, well, Eugene would know, the first minute of a street fight is yeah. totally different from the rest because everyone's fresh, the adrenaline's pumping. <clears throat> and even if you watch, like, Bully Beatdown back in the day, yep. for the first minute, some of those bullies do okay. You know what I mean? I mean, but, but after that, it separates a real fighter from, you know, a street fighter because that one-minute dump goes. Jerry was calm as hell. Uh, he was actually using techniques... Again, precedental. He was using uh, leg kicks when uh, when yeah, Frazzo right. was coming in. Formed yeah. together combinations. He went to a close guard when Frazzo got on top of him. Uh, the best primitive defense is, you know, control his head with one hand and overhook the other. So, yeah. you know, you're clear from punches on this side. You're controlling his head. And if you overhook that other hand. Yep. So it was just little things like that. And Jerry ended up toughing it out. Um, he ended up coming back and hit a sweet, uh, some nice counter wrestling because he was holding the overhook and the clinch. Mm -hmm. Ferrazzo went to throw him. Jerry held on to the wizard, countered it, spun over him. Uh, man, got That's in the right. front headlock right. and hit the guillotine, man. And that was, you know, it's I don't know how you want to equate it. Uh, Rocky, you know, watching someone win Wimbledon. I mean, I jumped off my couch. I could not fucking believe it. And it was yeah. me and kind of a bunch of my buddies who were really into that one at the time. And this was one of the first ones we had We had to wait till it came out on tape. I didn't right. get to buy the pay-per-view every time. And after that, I was hooked. V v VHS, VHS or beta? VHS, man. We're, you know, new school. Big time new school. <laughs> anybody, anybody under 30 has no idea what I'm talking about. VHS. Oh, wow. Yeah, and I definitely, I mean, I, I didn't deal a lot with Beta, but, I mean, they were around. And then just yeah. real quick, the other one, Don Fry, that was another big one because, I mean, to me, he was the quintessential wrestle boxer. His very fr I always mention him as one of the best debuts in MMA because we tend yeah. to talk about, you know, Vitor yep. and, you know, a lot of the real popular ones. In his very first night of professional MMA, Don, F Don Fry won three fights in a row, won the UFC right. 8 tournament. Yeah. First one, he knocked out the local Puerto Rican hero Thomas who was Harris. 200 and all. And yeah. Paco Chan, he was, it knocked him out with a short right, double jab, move it in, short right. And it was so funny, the crowd was going nuts. It's their hometown hero. Eight seconds into the fight, Don Fry, boom, boom, boom. The guy falls down in the crowd. You could 
I mean, you could. It was palpable. They were yeah. all like, "Wait a minute, what? That's it." So <laughs> that was, a, to me, a huge turning point for me personally, and I think for MMA as well, because that was when you know Blatnik had mentioned hybrid fighting and cross training, but it solidified and crystallized right there in that event. And to me, that was all Don Fry and Jerry Bolander. Mm. Well, an, an epic tale. That's my I'm, story, guys. It I'm was so bitter about that one because I missed the live pay per view because my in laws at the time, my ex wife's family, was in town and. And and uh, I went over to my friend's house where they had had a UFC party and everybody was still high on the crazy event and, and I, I got to watch it on tape delay but it wasn't the same it wasn't the same all right Eugene who was your who was your I can't, I, can't, I, can't, I can't believe you went for that hokey dope you know and one of the benefits of being an adult I think is that you you insofar as possible you do as much of what you want all the time I want yeah. to, I, especially I want, a single adult my friend yeah, I want to if I want to eat crisp with whiskey on it for breakfast, I'm doing it. <laughs> you should have said, hey, baby, I love you, but I'm watching the fights. You're well, in-law. you know, could have, should have, would have. I shouldn't have gotten married to her in the first place is, is what I should have done, but anyway. Yeah, you're right about that. That's well, you know, any port, in a, any, any port in a storm, man. Indeed. Indeed. <laughs> <laughs> Quite a storm it was. Well, right. Isn't that like the, the most unkind thing anybody could ever say? <laughs> Whatever. He <laughs> <You> was there. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, he did mention he did mention one of my picks, and and, and somehow I felt extremely embarrassed to have made this pick. So I, I say embarrassed because it, it, one thing I notice about Facebook, and what I think is a really beautiful, people cap on Facebook, but I think if you're old enough, you know that what Facebook has done has been pretty revolutionary. Has been that it's it's destroyed nostalgia. You know, and I talk about this on Knuckle Up. You know, you'd be sitting around in the old days pre Facebook going. Ah, I wonder what Sally is doing now, and then now because you can see Sally's yeah. turning into a bear, Mama. Yeah, oh my yeah, God. yeah. She now Sally now that's a that's a broad I wouldn't want to fight. She's a, she outweighs me. Sally could out, out fight me. You don't want to know Sally. So I, I I mean I say I say I say this by prelude to say when you see what he's become, it's sort of sad, you know. I mean I like my favorite line was going to a fight and going to press row. And and uh, and you're looking down and seeing people harassing him for autographs, and I go, oh look, it's the most dangerous man in the world. And my buddy goes, hey, I don't think he's the most dangerous guy in this role. And he was of course speaking about Ken Shamrock, and uh, and you know it, it feels like a cheesy pick now, but I, I have to say that you know I, I didn't, I knew about the sixty thousand or sixty five thousand dollar Gracie challenge when it was happening. And there was a mystique, you know, uh, connected to the family. But when I saw this kind of tiny guy come out in ill-fitting pajamas, which seemed to me to be off-white and therefore dirty, I was like, I, first of all, he's going to get killed, you know, against Art Jimerson, no less. He's going to get killed. And, 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 and secondly, when he did put on a submission, I couldn't see what it was because it was cloaked by the gi. So that's what the, that, was, that was probably the first my first <laughs> tentative step in the conspiracy where I started to claim, ah, this is, this, is, this is a fix. I didn't even see what he, uh, the guy just, how much did they have to pay the guy to tap, you know, how much? All right, man, let's see. So, I mean, so it wasn't, it, you know, Ken was, was a familiar, you know, I, I come from the sport, <laughs> and I say sport of bodybuilding, you know, <laughs> I go to this board of bodybuilding. You know, Taking one look at Sam Rock and said, he's got a nice stat going. That's right. Yeah, 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 exactly right. I was like, you know, they actually had a, yeah, I had already, I'd already turned the steroid fence at that point. So uh, he, he uh, you know, it was a familiar territory for me. And he came in, um, and it was, of course, the attitudinal, you know, aggressive thing that I thought should be part and parcel of. But it was very much part of the parcel of, of how I was fighting at that point, which is like, you know, Massive offensive, you know, moves, and uh, and you could see what he was doing. You know, you could actually see it was it was wrestling without the coach in the room. You know, uh, and uh, and I just liked the whole I liked the whole shtick. You know, the American badass, the, the initial American badass thing. I mean, you, you want to know how much I liked it? I mean, anybody who knows me knows that uh, up to with Jack Benny, notoriously thrifty. Or, or broke, as the case may be, Eugene Robinson. I actually went and, spot, uh, and spent money on his instructional DVD set, the Lion, Ken Shamrock Lions Den DVD set, which I still have somewhere. And it's funny to go back and look at it now because you, you don't really get a sense if you're in the sport of evolutionary changes. But I watch that stuff now 
90% of that stuff on that video would not work on the average guy in the average jiu-jitsu academy. <laughs> it's just, and you don't, you don't have the sense that we've evolved that much. So we've evolved, we've evolved to the point where he's no longer the most dangerous guy in the row. You know, he's kind of become a laughing stock. The publicized losses to, not publicized, the well-viewed losses to Tito. Tito's comment about, "I'll fight you every week if you want, Ken." You know. I mean, in the, the inevitable, the inevitable fall from grace. I asked Frank Shamrock once why he thought Ken hadn't been able to stay relative, uh, uh, re re sorry, relevant, and he said because he trains with the same guys and he's making no effort to update and to move beyond what was a skill set that used to work that no longer works. And that's a paraphrase, but that's pretty close to what he said. So uh, you know, again, I, 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 I'm having to do it with all these provisos, but for me. Shamrock, and this was like the first one. Shamrock, even though he ended up losing to Hoyce, uh, he was he was a, a familiar enough stepping stone for me that it was it made it a comfortable step for me to take. To think, hey, maybe I should move on from this Kempo ka Karate, <laughs> which is what I was doing <laughs> at the time, and maybe I should. And so it was. I made the jump to Muay Thai at that point, and then uh, with Matt Fury at AKA. Uh, uh, doing what at that point was called combat wrestling. <laughs> you know, combat with Paul, wrestling. With Paul Varlins and Brian Fury Johnston. So, too. what were the circumstances by which you came to be watching UFC One? Were you watching it live on pay per view? Or? Uh, number one, I think I watched it with a guy. Actually, it's weird. I watched it. I got. He lived in a crappy, uh, crappy apartment complex next to Seven Eleven, right here in Mountain View, where I'm now. And he has gone on to become like a multi bajillionaire and is a, a big sponsor presently of Kung Lee. So you see his name and emblem and stuff all over. And he made, you know, former Coke dealer, you know, was given one last chance by the courts and says, I'm going to make it in a way that I never would have made it in a million years. He is like the king of Northern California floor coverings. There you go. There you go. Coincidentally, the former Coke dealer of my hometown. His front operation was a floor covering business, but uh, well, there there may have been some crossover. I don't know anything <laughs> about that. <laughs> you know, I used to. I the guy had let us rehearse at his warehouse, and one day he called me in an insane lather and said, "You got to out of here." And so we haven't really been friends since then. But I suspect that maybe largely, uh, you know, that his his expectation that I I I not let him into a room that had thirty thousand dollars of equipment. It was more an issue of. I don't want these guys hanging around my warehouse. But in any case, he, he's a big he's a big backer of Kung Lee and G, uh, GFY uh, uh, Apparel, and uh, I watched it at his house. and And we we had heard about it coming up. Um, we lifted weights together at the same gym, so it was a, go a Gold's Gym connection. I said, hey man, have you heard about this thing? And I knew about I was bouncing at the time, so I knew about the Gracie challenge from some Aikido guy who was my who was my manager at the time. And so we we were in. He goes, I'm gonna buy it. I'll be there. And I, I, naturally, I, I did not pay my share of the <laughs> the pay per view. <laughs> yeah. uh, like Ben Franklin said, never ne never pay your share of the pay per view or something like that. I think that was a Ben. It's always so awkward to introduce the money into the whole thing, and you know yeah, you don't it's, really it's embarrass the host. It's, just, it's unseemly. I don't want to you know, embarrass a guy by giving him money. What kind of what kind of message would that send? Exactly. That's why one friend of mine. Embarrassing pick at all, though. That's, uh, uh, you know, conversely, a really respectable pick for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, 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 I, was yeah, just, yeah I think so. But I, I, just, I was, yeah. I was just rereading that interview that I did with Jerry, and if you, he, it's the only you type Jerry Bolander interview into Google, and that's the only one that that comes up. Yeah. But in there, he was, you know, I asked him a lot about the allegedly. Uh, sadistic training, you know, or tryouts for the Lions Den. That that was a big rumor for a while. And I asked him about Ken and Frank and all that. And he says right in the interview, um, I don't remember how. Some somehow he went out to the Lions Den, tried out, won their little in-class tournament. Ken took him aside and said, "You're good. You want to be a pro fighter?" And he said, "Yeah, but I got this and this going on." Ken loaned him a bunch of money, got him started, yep. let him stay with him. And yep. Jerry said in there, Ken. Never asked for it back. He said it took me way longer than I thought. I finally paid him back, but he said Ken used to do that with a bunch of our guys. So yeah, yeah I get I'll, what you're you know, saying. To, to be fair, I've never heard a single bad thing about Ken. <laughs> you know, seriously. You know, and and you know, as an MMA journalist, people will talk to you. You hear about oh, such and such did this, such and such. Did this. Never, not a single peep. About 
not can, you know. Nor have I. And I understand what you're saying because nowadays he's kind of looked at, but he, no one would be looking at him at all if it weren't for the foundation. And the foundation he right. laid was important, you know, it's extremely relevant, if not, inf you know, yep. highly influential to MMA. Yep. Yep. And he helped a bunch of people out. Can yep. you guys think, who was the first main uh, coaching team or camp squad in the United States, was it not the Lions Den? It was absolutely the Lions yep. Den. Yep. Yep. Absolutely the Lions Den. It's so funny though to to hear these stories now from Frank Shamrock and Bolander and and even Ken describing it himself. It's it just sounds barbaric. You know, there was very little. It was very much straight out of the Japanese school of you know, mm. go in there, work out till you puke, uh, and then you know your first sparring match will be Ken beating the crap out of you. Uh, very little instruction or telling you what happened. You were just supposed to figure it out, uh, trial by fire. And well, you know. well, I, I think I think the best I, I, they learned, earned my respect. I was like I said, I was at AKA. I was training with that prick Matt Fury, and he came back in the area and had a seminar. And at the seminar, he used to do this kind of PT Barnum thing of like, okay, just to show you my heart's in the right place, I'll fight any man in the house. And this kind of kid, you know. Raises his hand. He goes, I, I'd like to try. And was this Matt Fury or Shamrock? Huh? Is this Shamrock or Matt Fury? Who was this, doing is Matt, this is Matt Fury. This, see, okay. that's why I said the prick Matt Fury. I know, so, but then you said, <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay, all right. No, 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 sure. no, no, no. So this kid raises his hand. goes, I, I'd like to try, Mr. Fury. And he says, you come on up. And, and he and Fury go at it for about 35 minutes. And Fury can't put this kid away. And you can see it's like an embarrassment. And he's like, actually, like after the first five minutes, he's really trying just to everything, all the dirty moves. So just straight grappling, or are they fisticuffing? Oh, straight, no, no, straight, straight grab, straight grappling match. And uh, and then finally, after about thirty minutes, Fury goes, Ah, this kid is obviously great. Thanks everybody for coming, and you know, get the fuck. And so naturally, naturally, I'm like, boom! I go over to the kid. I go, Hey man, who are you? What are you? He goes, uh, uh, my name is Joe Hurley, you know, and I'm training at the Lions Den. I just figured I would get a little, and I was like, nice. Yeah, that was, I mean, that's when the Lions Den was the shit. And much like Nick Diaz, Hurley had like had some sort of minor league trouble. I mean, so he ran away from home. I could be remembering this wrong, but like at 14, 15, pulls into the Lions Den, and and uh, and, and Ken says. Fuck yeah, you can live here, sleep on the mats, whatever, man. Train all the time, and that's precisely what 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 he what he did. So, I mean, yeah, at, at the time, at the time, I don't even I, the stories. Hard work is different from sadistic. There there is a camp that is a sadistic camp, but that's all that whole Gokor, Judo Jean Lavelle, Carl Gotch. You know, Carl Gotch was a, he would make you do two thousand squats before he would teach you anything. If you didn't like it, you would leave. And then if he thought that you were you know, complaining, you need to take a break. He goes, oh, sure, take a break. And he would throw rice on the floor, <laughs> you know, so that if you had to kneel down because you were so dead from these squats, you were kneeling in rice, which was pretty uncomfortable. And he goes, look, look, Carl, I'm, I'm, I'm thirsty. And Carl would amble off to the bathroom, goes, you're thirsty, boy? And he would come back with, a, with one of those old-style uh, athletic uh, cups, you know, with, 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 water, with water in it. Hey, boy, you, you're thirsty, boy? You, you want to drink? Now that's, this guy's a sadistic motherfucker, man. Yeah. <laughs> and, I, and the only reason I can say that now is because he's dead. Yeah. Because <laughs> otherwise I would be way, I'd be way too, I'd be way too afraid to to to, to say any such like thing. So. Yeah, Joe Hurley well, was a badass too, man. Carl, yeah. yeah. Who, who? Yeah. Carl Gotch was a badass. Yeah. And no, Hurley Joe, too. Joe Hurley. Oh, Hurley, Hurley was a, Hurley was a badass. Yeah, he had real he had, underrated had, guy. I can't remember who, but he got a he got I think one maybe two big wins, surprising yeah. wins. You thought who the hell was you know who the hell was this kid? And yep. Fought a bunch of tough guys. I mean, yeah. tough tough bastard for sure. I yeah. think he had some, ended, ended up having some character problems or some such thing. I don't remember, but it was yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. yeah. All right. Yeah. So. Yeah, well, that, gonna... that's my pick. That's my pick, and I'm sticking to it. That, that's a good one. And one last thing about Shamrock. He did come out of the lineage of Carl Gotch, though. That, you know, Gotch trained the Japanese guys who trained yep. Shamrock. And so I think that that ethic of just push him and push him and push him yeah, and the ones who don't that. break are the winners yeah. was, was where uh, Ken was coming from. And, you know, but, you, and, but, you, but, you, but, you know, when I started training jiu-jitsu, coming from co what they call combat wrestling, they had to pull me aside all the time and say, hey, hey, what are you doing, you know? <laughs> I go, I'm just trained. He goes, no, man, we don't, we don't do that here. The chin and the eye socket, you know, the elbow and the throat, the, the, rape, the rape chokes. 
Like, you know, yeah. and even now, even now, Sir Rao is, like, always telling me, don't, do, that's him in the background, shirtless. He goes, don't do that, Eugene. And it's like, man, it takes a long time to unlearn that dirty shit, you know. Because that was just part, part and parcel of life, you know, with these old catch wrestler guys, so. But Combat yeah, Grappling, you're... that was way ahead of its time. Remember way back in the day, Ted Williams' Combat Grappling was <laughs> real big? <laughs> Ted Williams is great. You know, last time I saw Williams, he had on, like, a fucking fur coat. And he had he must have had like two two hundred pound black prostitutes with him. <laughs> that was like one it under each one right. under each arm. I'm looking at Ted. I'm like, you got it going on, man. <laughs> like the greatest thing ever. Uh, he was a great guy. <laughs> sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> but, uh, we have got far afield here. Actually, uh, you know, that, a lot of foresight there, though, because if you think about it, I because w- I was gonna call. What Jerry and a lot of those guys did, to me, that's like submission wrestling. You know, yeah, not yeah. quite catch wrestling because they're all, you know, they have their own that I still don't quite understand. But it was wrestling with with basic catches. You know, you don't want to be, you, you, you have to know how to fight off your guard. But if you can take a guy down and get on top, yep. punch him, submit him. And yep. to me, that's the blueprint for a lot of guys today. Michael Chandler, wrestlers that don't want to be yep. jujitsu purists. You're right. Top control, posi- right. you know, don't give up position. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. all like a real, pretty much groundbreaking, you know, yeah. theories. Just a lot of different elements. And we, 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 I always we do this stuff with the proviso. Like today, half guard, and then you bury the head. You're going for like a half guard sweep. I said, yeah, you know, this is a jujitsu competition thing. If you're on the street fight and you're burying, you know, you're you got some guy in your half guard and you're burying that head in the knee, you gotta count on the fact that he's gonna start punching you in the jaw. Count on it. Count on it. <laughs> no, or knee you in the head. Yeah, well, yeah, or, or put the knee on the jaw and start punching you in the face. So right. yeah, you can better better believe it. So, but I mean, this is why we have MMA. <laughs> no, I, I love ju- I love jujitsu, but MMA kind of keeps you honest sometimes. It's just even thinking about it. So. Um, well, well, I know everybody's anxious. Like and they've been like, we've heard these guys and their and their dumb picks. Who's Kid Nate? Who's Kid Nate's choice? That's what people want to know. They use Ek Machina. Kid Nate is gonna fly through the clouds and he's gonna go. My pick is oh, Hoist Gracie. Amazed. That's my pick. Hoist Gracie, man. Like I, I, I'd been. I'd been in something where I, I'm going to be a writer, and so I was. I was. I wasn't leaving my apartment. I was writing, you know, 900 words a day and never leaving the house. And I was hearing about this UFC thing, like, and and it wasn't until UFC three that like the advertising penetrated my brain, and somehow the name Shamrock and Gracie had already had these auras around him, even though I was just yeah. seeing like an ad, not even paying attention to it. But I could tell, wow, these guys sound like they're really tough or something. But it was uh, then a couple more years before I. Um, actually saw the videos and some friends of mine had gotten a hold of the UFC videos and they were like, Nate, you've got to see this. You will love this. And so I went out and I rented uh, UFC 3. I wanted to start at the beginning but could not find UFC 1 anywhere. That mm-hmm. held me up for weeks and finally I was like, fuck it. I'll just rent what I can get. And I got UFC 3 and I put it in. Hoist Gracie and Kimo Leopoldo. And just the the sight of Ho- little Hoist Gracie and his little gi fighting this monster but so methodically and so calmly and matter-of-factly just like, oh, dude left himself open to get kneed in the nuts. I'm going to knee him in the nuts three times. Oh, dude's got a ponytail. I'm just going to hang on it and punch him in the face. Yeah. I mean, it just, it was so, it reminded, I had been into Red Adair, the oil field firefighter, you know, read all these biographies on that guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and it was just this, this concept of people who could attack the most dangerous forces in the world, like an oil field fire, just through logic and be like, well, what do you do with that? You know, and he's like, well, let's get some fucking dynamite and blow it up. You know, like Hoist Gracie was like, I'm fighting this monster who's twice my size. What am I going to do about that? Well, I'm going to learn different ways to defend myself, and then I'm going to just inflict pain on this dude in any way possible without – it was like the thing I liked about Hoist was he was not looking at chemo as a person. He wasn't trying to like, I'm going to dominate you, man. This is between you and me. This was like – you are an entity, and I'm going to solve you like a problem. Like right. he wasn't even giving him the, the the credence or the dignity of treating him like a person. He was just like, you know, you are you are just a thing, and I'm going yeah. to stop you. And yeah. I loved it. it. It it totally like I went crazy for months. Fedor gets credit for it, but Royce was quite cyborg esque back in those days, like yeah. cold, clinical, methodical. 
Yeah. No, I would, yeah. I would give, I would give the, I would give the Cyborg Prize to Oleg Taktarov, who was, was almost going to be my pick, just because I loved his, his dispassion. You know, you couldn't tell whether what he was doing, like whether he was at the grocery store, you know, taking a nap. He was the same coming in the cage as he was coming out. You know. Yeah, he was more like, lackadaisical though, almost. I mean, it almost seemed too mellow, especially Blank when. Spare. Blank stare yeah. at all times. Just, just dead-eyed. But but Hoist, I mean, Hoist was mean, and you could tell there was passion there. He just wasn't engaging the other person as a person until yeah, right. it got to the Ken Shamrock. You know, by the time he and Ken yeah. finally had their rematch at UFC Five, which was one of the darkest days of my life, man. I could not believe. Uh, I, I was so furious and livid uh, that that Shamrock just got the takedown and turtled up like that. See, I hated Ken Shamrock, man. I, the idea that that I, I don't take it all personally now, but back in the day, I was so hard on my sleeve with this stuff. And Ken Shamrock was such a fucking dumbass. He could never make an adjustment inside the cage. And it used to drive me crazy. And so, like, I tolerate. I mean, he was fine, like, when he was getting the guillotine on Dan Severn. But then when he would, like, when he had the fight with Taktarov and just laid on him, punched him in the ribs over and over again for 30 minutes, it was just like. Crazy making, and then the infamous Detroit slap fest with Severn. Man, that's when I completely lost my shit with Shamrock. That was just uh, completely infuriating. That's the, for those of you who don't know. That's about where Dan Sam, Dan Severn and Ken Shamrock were fighting for the UFC super belt title in a rematch. UFC nine. A judge ruled they couldn't use closed fist punches, and the UFC guys were just like, "Fuck it, guys, go ahead and do it." And Shamrock, for whatever reason, was the only guy who followed the rule. And, and would only hand slap. And it, to, to this day, it still drives me crazy. What the fuck? You know, like, he was used to that from Pancras, though. Yeah, exactly. Well, that was part of it. And his explanation is, you know, he was just a law-abiding guy, and if you told him the rules, he wasn't going to break them. But, you know, I mean... And you can also knock people out with open-hand slap, you know? It's true. Boss yeah. Rutten used to Boss do it Rutten. with those, those yeah. you know, palm strikes. And, and yeah. so, you know... Uh, it was, but 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 Ken and I used to hate Don Fry too because he just seemed like such a jock meathead. Dude, he just, came in. I would just want he. Was I mean, I loved humble. watching him fight. I mean, everybody was excited about him, but I just always I, really. I, I didn't hate Don Fry until he got creepy with my daughter, and I almost had to shoot him in San Jose. And then, yeah, and that, that would. That, uh, that kind of kind of sort of turned me on. And that I was more amused at the whole, the drunken hotel beatdown he got, but him saying. Ah, your daughter's beautiful. I go, yes, yeah, she is. He goes, you're really going to have to watch out. I go, I know. You're going to have to get a gun. I said, I got a gun, Don. I got it right here, man. You know, you don't stop. <laughs> like, you know. You know, they were comparing Fry to Tom Selleck when he came in, but he was, and he did have that, but he was the most sinister ass Tom Selleck ever. Yeah. You know, in a video game or whatever, you can choose the evil eyebrows that are like all cocked up. I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. He, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I he did. was, I mean, that's why he was good in that, uh, what, what the hell was that movie with Johnny Depp, but uh, Dillinger? Was Remember? he in that movie? He was yeah, in Dillinger? He was. He no, was. that was Fry Public was in Enemies, Dillinger? right? He Public was Enemies. Yeah, or yeah, that's what it was. Public Enemy. He had the, uh, the you know, the, the throwback mustache, you know, the retro mustache. He, he was great in that. I mean, that's he's been making his money in movies. I think he's been in a couple of them. Uh, huh. uh, put him in his I'll name in IMDb. I'm pretty sure. I'll have to check that. Out. The 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 uh, uh, mind exploding thing was when Shamrock and Fry finally fought each other, and and that, that was when Pride was hard to get on pay per view, and I had to wait like two days, and I was trying to not find out who won, and finally got the 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 stream or. I, can't, I think I got the, the tape mailed to me but uh, and put it in there. And, I mean, that fight totally delivered it. And it actually made me love both guys because both mm -hmm. guys just went at it so hard and so recklessly. And when they were snapping each other's ankles and you could tell, like, yeah, I remember this. you know, dude, your ankle's broken and you're just going to hop back up and <laughs> keep fighting. I who, was won like, that, who, 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 won, who won that fight? I'm not, I'm not, I don't remember this. Um, it was a decision, and I'll have to look it up. Because that it, it can won the decision. I believe so. Who's, yeah. Whose who's ankle got broken? I remember both of them. They had each other in mutual um, ankle locks, and I mean, I know Shamrock's was better. But, Fry's uh, was worse, yeah, for sure. But I still think uh, Shamrock later came out and said that he was seriously injured 
in that fight. And they both admitted, or Fry has admitted, I think Shamrock never did, that they were on, you know, Vicodin. Fry yeah, was on all kinds of shit. Come That's on, pretty come on, Fry come on. Vicodin. Yeah, I mean, you know. Yeah, yeah. Vicodin is a, is, a, is a public face of what he said he was taking. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Now Fry won the split decision, Dallas. Fry Did he? Was, yeah, that's a, that's a green on Fry's wiki, not on Ken's. But mm. neither guy was ever the same after that. I mean, it totally that was like the 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 end of their uh, uh, you know run as real contenders. Yeah, I gotta go. I gotta go with Frank Shamrock or uh, Frank Mir on this. It's a tough sport, and we're big, dangerous guys. <laughs> you know, no joke, man. Yep. Serious deal. So. Yep. You know. Yep. It was ugly. Well, any final thoughts? We're going to call the show, fellas. Final thoughts. Final no thoughts. Not Anybody the these days? Like, who do you think? Who do you think the kids are liking these days? That's what I want to know. Who, who, who do you think kids are getting into? Well, I, I, I think, I think you're almost to, to a good question. <laughs> <laughs> Bring it out of me. Bring it out of me. Well, I, I think the good, the good question is, you know, given that we've, we've identified our, our inspirational heroes, you know, it, it. it are there through lines from those heroes to anybody today who's bringing the same sort of gravitas, who's converting people like we were converted by these guys were back then right now? I think that's what you were trying to say, right? Uh, that's, that's fair enough. And maybe Ronda Rousey's doing that for some of these gals. Um, My instinct is it's impossible because this yeah, is the exception yeah. of the sport. There's no yeah. parallels. There's no comparisons. Well, yeah, and, and, and the reason for that is, and it's something in, in, in what Kid Nate just said, the reason for that is somebody, once we were talking about the AIDS virus, and a buddy of mine who was an epidemiologist said some, something like, you understand it's a virus. I go, yeah, okay. He goes, no, it's a virus. You know, you know g geneticists used to make the joke that people were genes as way of reproducing themselves. You know, just think of a, a virus as, <laughs> I mean, it is an unsuccessful virus if it kills its host. Its primary objective is to pass itself on to another host. You know, if it kills its host, it also dies. So it doesn't, I mean, he, I go, yeah, because ultimately HIV, AIDS will get to the point where it is, a, it is a virus that you can actually live with, you know, like the flu virus. And I go, ah, you're crazy. I mean, this was back in the 90s he was saying this. He said, you're crazy. And he goes, ultimately, now he's been proven out. You got, you know, Magic Johnson's looking pretty hale and fucking hearty, you know. But that's more the medications than the virus evolving. But the medications, uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, well, it's probably a combination of the medications and the cofactors. If you cut down on the cofactors, you're probably more likely to be, to be healthy. But I think in general, it's not just rich guys who are affording expensive medications. It's guys who are also cutting back on cofactors. But it, it, it has mutated to the point where people are living longer with it. And I think fundamentally, if you were to be fighting like the way those guys were fighting today, you would have very short careers. So I think MMA fighters have learned to have thrilling sports to beat guys. You know, as real as it gets, it's still pretty real. But they, they've managed to. They haven't gone. I mean, WWE came from pro, pro grapplers figuring out to make money, we have to fight every night. If we're fighting every night for real, we can't do it. So why don't you say we just kind of work this up because now it's work. You know, we got to fight every day. So I think UFC fighters, MMA fighters presently have gotten to the point where they can fight all out. And, then, I mean, what, Matt Brown got a 30-day suspension? That's nothing. That's a vacation, you know, um, for a guy who's got some facial contusions. So all in all, the sport has migrated to the, part, to the point where toughness is, is certainly part of the picture, but it's not as much of a picture as it was back when you could do anything and the head butts and the eye gouges and the nut punches and so forth. That's when that's when toughness was really a pretty major factor. So eye gouges were always banned from. I mean, even yeah, UFC important, one, right? Important. They always say no rules. But so when I watched UFC eight, that's what I was reminded of. Scott right. Ferozo, three hundred and thirty pounds. Jerry Bolander, one eighty. Ferozo's on top of him, headbutting yeah. him. You know, yeah. headbutting yeah. him. I mean, that's I, fucking. Did you see? Did you see Ferozo fight uh, Tank Abbott in the backyard brawl oh, in yeah. Ohio? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That was great. My favorite part about that is the fifty thousand dollars in the uh, in the uh, in the uh, uh, Safeway uh, uh, a bag that they paid him at the airport when he showed up. Yeah, it has <laughs> been so long. I haven't seen it in a while, actually. You should check I, it out. YouTube. I it, watched it this year for some reason. It it, it uh. It may, I was fantasizing that it was like old punk rockers settling their vendettas, you know, like yeah. it, was, it was, you know, it was like the guys from Minor Threat finally getting a shot at Ian McKay or something that 
Except well, you know, my, my favorite after. thing is when Ian Mackay and I were talking in the backyard at Tesco V's house, and he was like, you know, if I was angry enough, I, I could take anybody. I go, really? He goes, yeah, I could take a guy like you. I go, really? <laughs> was, this, was, was this young Ian? Yeah, of course. We were like 19 at the time. He, I think yeah, he was yeah. about a year, year older than me. So I was 19, he was 20. I was like, well, just try it. He's like, ah, no, no, I'm not, I'm not angry enough now. I was like, all right. <laughs> just kick him in the balls. <laughs> uh, no, he was, you know, he was. That's what those guys were all super unhealthy. So they were like, you know, that JFA song, Cokes and Snickers. That's what they were eating, man. They were drinking lots of. Actually, Ian, my threat guys were Pepsi guys. They drinking lots of Pepsi, eating candy bars, making Seven Eleven runs for shit food, and jacked up on sugar, and thinking that, yeah, if I'm angry enough. If I'm angry enough, I could take a guy like you. Yeah, yeah. Isn't that a you thing, though? Because I got to the point in any competition, especially fights, but basketball, any sport you were playing, yeah. where you got to the point where you were pissed off. You felt like you could do no wrong. You were a god of that. Yeah, well, it's because you had the natural testosterone in your system where you could actually get beyond that 60-second mark. But, you know, pretty much, it doesn't mean you could get to the 120-second mark. <laughs> you know, three minutes. My, my buddy saw these uh, uh, Caltrans workers get into a fight and they tore off their hat, their gloves, and their vest, and they start swinging. And like about, my buddies are kind of watching, and about 20 seconds in, like the swings are coming slower. And about 40 seconds in, they're both standing there with their, their hands on their knees, like, whoo, ha, ah, whoo. And then they slowly have to pick up their shit, their gloves, their hats, their vest, and they go back to work together. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> <laughs> That's where that one minute adrenaline dump comes in real handy in the schedule. You can have an all out war, just this maddening brawl. But it's forty seconds long and then you can, you know, <laughs> grab right, some right, lunch right, and be right. back to work on time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, what do you talk about with the other dude after that? Man, that was some brawl we had. Yeah. <laughs> I thought you had me in that first five you seconds. Had me in that. <laughs> but then eight, at second eight, eight, I really turned it around. <laughs> By second 15, <laughs> no one knew what was going on. <laughs> Man, it was crazy. By, minute, by 30, the 30 second minute second, it was tough, tough. So anyway. Yep. All right. Well, fellas, fun show. And let's see. We got we got some UFC action or something coming up. Dallas, do you have any idea what the next UFC is? It's like UFC no. Kung Lee versus Nine. Bisping? Or... No, it's, it's uh, Ryan Bader versus OSP is the next one. Yeah, so... That really confirms. No, I have no idea. I just knew we had a, like a week or so off, a little respite, and I planned. Yeah, on we have we have a tiny respite here, and we're believe me, we are making the most of it. Have big this plans. Will, this will give me some some time to rob a few liquor stores. Since Vice <laughs> Vice magazine is not paying me uh, on time, so those, so, those so if you probate. see if you see the surveillance video, it's and it looks like me, it's not me. It wasn't me. <laughs> wasn't me. James in the clear, kids. I wasn't James. robbing liquor stores like I said I was going to rob a liquor store. That wasn't me. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Good thing uh, we know he's just kidding, Eugene. Just kidding. All right, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead and give us a like on this video on YouTube. <laughs> Subscribe to MMAnation.com on YouTube so you don't miss a minute of the magic. Follow us on Twitter at Eugene S. Robinson, at Uncle Justice. I'm at Kid Nate, and read us on bloodyelbow.com. It's, like, it's, like it's, like it's like Spinal Tap says, do I have to come right out and say it? Give me some money. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. I amused myself. Spare change, anything. All right. 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 Asta.